Welcome everybody to the next iteration of the IITE seminar series. Before uh, we commence, please check out the chat. I've put in a message from Mike Fowler, who's one of our regular attendees, who has a uh, postdoc position advertised at Swansea University. In case you're interested, uh, please check out the link and the information there. With that, it is my pleasure to welcome Chris Klausmeyer to our seminar series from Michigan State University, who is going to be talking to us about meta-community ecology, and unifying frameworks for meta-community ecology. So without further ado, Chris, please, the floor is yours. All right. Well, thanks for the introduction and invitation, Jury. And uh, thanks to you all for coming to uh, nerd out for an hour on stochastic meta-community models with me. Um, so this is a project that started you know, a few years ago um, with some REU um, research experience for undergraduate students in the summer. And so we'd only planned on taking one REU some student that summer, but we had at least two ex very excellent applications. So we had to say yes to both of them. So this was joint work with Akshata Rud Rudrapatna and Brian Lurch. Um, Akshata is now an dual MD PhD program at University of Cincinnati. Brian's a PhD student at University of North Carolina. And since I didn't want to be outnumbered by undergraduates, I enlisted our postdoc, Tomat Kofel, to help um, with the advising on this. So it was a really fun summer. Um, and since Akshada and Brian came with such excellent training from Case Western, um, taking classes with Karen Abbott, Robin Snyder. Um, they were really ready you know, to give them a lot of freedom. So ask them what they wanted to work on. They said something involving stochasticity. And that suited me fine because it's a topic that I've never really delved into. So it seemed like perfect summer project. And in particular, what I was thinking about at the time was meta-community ecology, having just read this uh, Princeton monograph by Leibold and Chase. So, you know, just so we're all on the same page here, um, meta community is defined as a set of local communities linked by dispersal of multiple potentially interacting species. And usually when we think of meta communities, we think of sort of a patchy uh, landscape, which could in fact be a patchy landscape, but it could also be, you know, different um, disease organisms within hosts. It could be ponds. Um, there are a lot of different interpretations. And, one of the organizing themes in meta community ecology has been this iconic figure, which tried to lay out and organize existing meta community theory along two dimensions one of dispersal and one of patch heterogeneity. And this was meta community ecology 1.0, um, Sensu Matthew Leibold. Um, and one of the themes in the book then is is there some way to unite these into a single uh, uber meta community model. Is it possible? And so, because they're all in their own different mathematical frameworks and they don't talk to each other. So when I read the book, my intuitive feeling was, no, it's just too complicated, can't be done. What, why was I pessimistic? Because we have to deal with multiple species, to make it a community, multiple patches to make it a meta community, multiple patch types to account for species sorting. And then to me, the real deal killer is this last one, demographic stochasticity, which is required um, to encompass neutral theory. So the, the plan though, after this summer is maybe. Um, so the theme of this talk is gonna be getting to yes. And so we'll start out with a one species pedagogical example on how to incorporate um, demographic stochasticity in models. And then we'll move on to a two species lack of Volterra competition model, um, which will be the main focus. And we'll have two versions of it, one in open system, which is a bit of a warm up, And then the second one will be the closed system, uh, which is the true meta community. So the pedagogical example I throw in here to make sure we're all thinking about this the same way, also, it's something that I was vaguely aware of, but hadn't worked on before. So it's maybe not as uh, universally well known um, as it should be. And so we're gonna focus on one species in one patch, and but subject to this demographic stochasticity. And there's gonna be the 
stochastic analog of logistic growth, which we're all familiar with. So the way we're going to model the demographic stochasticity here is by treating this as a continuous time Markov process, which defines, well, first of all, the state of the system is this non-negative integer lattice. So um, we have an act, we're taking into account the discrete nature of populations. And the model is then defined by random transitions between these different states. And here we've got two processes, a, a birth process and a death process, which happen at particular rates. And so what it means to happen at a rate is that in every small little chunk of time dt, the probability of that ha event happening is, is the rate times dt. And so you can see that you know there's basically going to be some sort of random walk of sorts along the non-negative integer lattice here. So this is the how we define the model. How can we analyze it? Well, the first thing we can do is we can simulate it. Um, there's a nice algorithm for that called the Gillespie algorithm, which pretty efficient and gives you a trajectory that looks like this. So we see we grow up around the carrying capacity and then fluctuate around there. And if we want to boil this down a little bit, we can wait for it to settle on to its um, long-term attractor and then make a histogram of the population size like so. So this is nice, but this is basically why I don't want to deal with demographic stochasticity because the results are super ugly like this, right? You got this line going up and down. This histogram looks all kind of weird. Um, so if we wanted to make a better picture, we'd have to run it longer. Who wants to do that? So the thing that you can do, though, is use what's called um, a master equation approach. And here, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the dynamics of probability mass. So what's the dynamics of the probability that the system is in a certain state? For example, what's that it has one individual. And so all these transitions from this graph down here correspond to changes in this probability mass over time. So this is elegant. We've got it back into differential equations, which is good. Um, but unfortunately, we've, so what, what's good about this? So now we don't have to do any of that stochastic simulation, thankfully. Um, but the downside is we have a large number of di differential equations, technically infinite, right? Because you have an arbitrarily large population size, but we, in practice, just truncate this at about twice the carrying capacity. Um, so still, you know, for this particular example, we've got 100 linear differential equations. Um, but what's cool about it is you can use it to solve the time-dependent um, dynamics. Even better, you can find the, the stationary distribution, what happens as time goes to infinity. Um, if you put this into a vector matrix form, it looks like this. So it looks kind of like a continuous time version of a Leslie matrix model. And because probability mass is conserved, we know that there's a dominant eigenvalue of zero and the stationary distribution is given by the corresponding eigenvector. So there's numerically efficient ways to solve for the stationary distribution. So we can go ahead and do that with our logistic equation analog. And this is what we find. Maybe you don't see it here, but basically the probability is zero for all positive numbers and 100% for extinct. So in the long term, um, all species are going to go extinct in this model. So this is not what we were really going after here. Um, so there are a few possible fixes for this. Um, one is to look at finite time numerically. Second one is you can solve for a quasi-stationary distribution conditioned on non-extinction. But given the direction that we want to go with this, which is the meta-community direction, we took the third option, which is to add immigration. Okay, And if you always have the possibility of getting um, recolonized from, from beyond, then you can get a proper stationary distribution, which looks like this. Okay, And so this was... Uh, I've read about this before, but not carefully. And it turns out this is not new results, okay? It goes back at least to Kendall, 48, and, and uh, Feller, 1939, and both of which are actually really nice papers to look at. 
Um, so this, this general framework and some of these results are known for single species with immigration. But now we want to move this up to our two species, um, Laca Volterra competition. And the deterministic analog is above, and the different possible events are shown below. Um, notice here the way we've got the immigration formulated is it's more of a migration. It's exchange with the regional um, pool. And so a key parameter here, a few of them, little m, that's the migration rate between the folk, this focal patch we're looking at and the rest of the universe. And NR is the abundance of a particular species um, out there in the, in the region, okay? And so this is how, what we're doing. And again, we can formulate these mastery equations. Uh, gets a little bit, the counting becomes a little bit picky um, because we've now got this two-dimensional state space and a lot more possible transitions. I should uh, forgot to mention, we also have this bottom transition here, which is a disturbance, which just wipes out everyone in the patch at rate big E. Uh, we won't use this a lot, but we'll come back to it at the end. Okay, and then you can translate this into, again, a large set of uh, linear differential equations. Um, technically infinite in two dimensions, but again, we truncate um, at twice the carrying capacity. So if we pick a carrying capacity of 50, in each dimension, we've got up to 100 individuals, so basically about 10,000 um, differential equations. And again, our approach here is going to focus on the stationary distribution. So again, we need this immigration to keep everyone alive. Again, going back, you know, historically, um, this isn't completely uh, unknown model. Um, the earliest reference I found, um, well, I kind of worked my way back and eventually got to Arley, who was using this for some kind of neutrons in stars. <laughs> um, and Chang was the first to apply it in ecology. Um, but, you know, these last two papers, you know, managed to get some results because the early papers just set up the equations and because they didn't have computers, they really couldn't do very much with them. Um, but, you know, this, this segment of this talk is in some way very closely building on this paper of Capitan et al. 2015. Okay, so that's the setup. This is to remind us of the five possible outcomes of Latka Volterra competition. And we're going to use this left figure a lot. So this is just organizing the different outcomes as a function of the inter-specific competition coefficients, um, assuming equal carrying capacities. So as we all know, species one wins, species two wins, they coexist. Founder control, which is indicated by this stripey pattern. And then, you know, the whole neutral theory is just this point in the center. Okay, so let's look at some numerical solutions of this Latka Volterra model in this open system subject to migration with the region. So we're going to start in the case where two species in the deterministic model are predicted to coexist and migration is relatively high and carrying capacity for both species is 50. So they're subject to some kind of ecological drift here. So the left is the stationary probability distribution. The right is an example of the time, example time series of the dynamics, um, but this is more for intuitive feeling um, no stochastic simulations were used in making this figure on the left. Okay, so in this case, you know, pretty much lines up with the deterministic world where they they're predicted to coexist, and they do. But if, now let's turn down the migration rate in order of magnitude. Now we see something different. Now we get this, you know, interesting looking uh, trimodal probability distribution. So the system alternates between coexistence for a while, one of the species goes extinct due to demographic uh, stochasticity, but it's reintroduced from, from dispersal. And then after a while, maybe the other species goes extinct. So this 
this trimodal distribution, as far as I can tell, was first noted in that Capitan et al. paper. And a bit on this color coding scheme here, um, we want to, at some point, boil these results down. So we've broken up the probability distribution into basins and color coded it by whether it's coexistence basin or one species or the other dominating. And then if we decrease migration one more order of magnitude, now we see that you know, drift is basically much stronger than, than the stabilizing force of coexistence. So most of the time it's monodominance by one species. So different from the deterministic world. All right, next let's look at the case where species coexist in the deterministic world. And now we're gonna go back, we're gonna crank up dispersal starting from low. So in this case, um, the red species is the better competitor. Uh, the blue one makes a few tries, but never really gets very far. Um, if we increase dispersal in order of magnitude, then you see the blue one coming in and out irregularly and increase it one more order of magnitude, then you see that long-term um, co-occurrence, um, apparent coexistence of these two species where the blue species, the inferior competitor is you know, kept alive through mass effects. And finally, you know, founder control case, um, again, it looks kind of with low dispersal, looks kind of similar to the coexistence case with low dispersal, um, where you have the two alternate um, equilibria and occasional you know, lucky transitions between them. If we increase migration a little bit, we still see the two different attractors, but now because of mass effects, um, whoever is losing is still kept in the game but crank it up more and it looks apparently like coexistence, okay? So these are just to give, give you a feel for what, um, what happens with demographic stochasticity in this model. Um, moving on, we wanna break this up into a way that we can scan parameter space. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna integrate the probability within each of these basins and turn it into this, um, what we call a square pie diagram. So this indicates that 31% of the time species one is dominating, 31% species two is dominating, and 37% of the time uh, they're apparently coexisting. Okay. So then we can align these, you know, we can lay out these square pi diagrams along the same axes as our Lotka Volterra uh, alpha space. So this is a case of low dispersal. And again, the deterministic expectation is at the lower left here. So what do we see here? First of all, if we're in a region where one species is predicted to outcompete the other, it basically does still. Um, if we move into the deterministic coexistence region down here, we see that coexistence is preserved if the stabilizing force um, is strong enough, but otherwise um, it could be that if, you know, the blue species is weakly coexisting here, it could in fact be excluded more or less. I mean, remember there's, it's an open system, so they're always migrating in, but you don't really see them here. And along the border here is where we get these trimodal distributions. Moving up into the founder control region, what we find is that um, it's pretty much pinched in. Um, again, the one species or the other wins apparently region gets larger and the apparent um, bimodal um, founder control region gets really narrowed in, okay? Uh, now take a look at the effect of increasing population size, which should diminish the effect of demographic stochasticity. Well, here's carrying capacity of 100, here's 200. What we see then is down here, as we expect, the coexistence region is getting, the effective coexistence region is getting larger. Um, I was a little bit surprised to find that the founder control region actually got, the apparent founder control region actually got smaller, but that's how it is. Um, 
So this is the results, you know, this is a little, mostly background for what we want to get to. Um, but let's sum up what we've learned so far. Um, demographic stochasticity, it's sort of a hassle to deal with, but we've got a few tricks. Um, we need immigration for long-term persistence. Outcomes are a little bit fuzzy, like we don't have a clear what's coexistence, what isn't. Um, demographic stochasticity decreases the coexistence region and really decreases the region of apparent founder control. And I didn't mention this, but you know that one point of neutrality, um, alpha is equal one, there's, there's really nothing special about it anymore. It's just a point in this space. Okay, so part one, we, we're done now. We've looked at a community model subject to demographic stochasticity with two species, but only one patch. And to do this, it required about 10,000 differential equations. So if we want to move to the meta community model, this is why I was initially thinking that this is going to be intractable, because if one patch was so bad, how are we going to do a lot of patches in a meta community? But it turns out that there is a trick available. And this is one of those, you know, where we're in a little jam session in the in the summer working with the students, and this kind of floated out, and we were pretty psyched by this trick. Um, so we're calling it meta for cheap. Okay, so where do these migrants come from? Um, in a meta community with an infinite number of patches, all identical underneath, right? Same abiotic um, characteristics. Um, the regional abundance is actually the same as the average um, of any given patch. So we assume that the system's ergodic and then we can make this substitution of space for time and equate the regional abundance with the average abundance given by this formula. So if we plug that into our mastery equations, um, we then end up with a closed system for an infinite number of patches with no extra equations here. Um, but then the downside is that the mastery equations become nonlinear. But that's actually kind of good in some way because it solves a few problems for us. First of all, it allows there to be multiple equilibria um, at any given point, and then we can assess their stability. In particular, we can use uh, invasion criteria to get sharp results for translating local dynamics into the regional outcome of competition at the meta community scale. So we were pretty psyched when we came up with this. Um, later on, we realized that was actually discovered before uh, by Metz and Gillenberg, and it's also used in the epidemiology literature under the name of household structured epidemics, but still cool. All right, so now we plug this into our master equations and we have our, say, 10,000 nonlinear equations for the probability distribution. We're gonna have to deal with this numerically. So one thing you can do is just numerically brute force it, um, put it into you know, your favorite differential equation solver and solve it forward in time. So we did that. Um, just trying to get the undergrads hooked on Fortran, but I was the only one that actually was doing that. Um, but, you know, and this is pretty good. Computers are fast these days. Um, we could solve one of these in approximately 30 seconds. Um, but that's you know, still going to be too slow if you want to get some, you know, clean scan of parameter space. So then the second tactic we used was what we can call clever numerics, um, which is going to be efficient ways to solve for equilibria and calculate invasion criteria. All right. So the brute force way to solve for equilibria would be you have these 10,000 coupled ODEs and you're trying to find an equilibrium of it. So you can set them equal to zero and apply Newton's method to find an equilibrium numerically. But 10,000 dimensions, it's easy to get lost. So you're gonna have a hard time actually finding that equilibrium. So the, the insight that we had here was that in fact, it's not 10,000 dimensions, it's actually only two. Um, so we're gonna reduce this to a, you know, effectively a two dimensional system where those two dimensions are the average abundance of species one and the average abundance of species two. So we're gonna take our 
open system that we've talked about earlier and stick it inside this black box. And we'll feed in read a guess for the regional abundance of the two species, calculate the stationary distribution, and then add up the regional, the average abundance coming out. Um, and so then an equilibrium is simply gonna be where those two things are equal to each other. And so this provides an efficient way to find uh, meta community equilibria numerically, because now we're just doing Newton's method in two dimensions. Um, and so this is an example of what one of those equilibria will look like. Um, and second, we can use the same toolbox for calculating invasion criteria, pretty much as you'd expect, put one species in by itself, let it go to its metapopulation equilibrium, introduce a small amount of the, of the invading species and see what pops out, okay? If the average abundance of the invader is larger than the input regional abundance, then we say that species two uh, successfully invades. And I should say this is a, I mean, it's a little bit ad hoc. We were kind of making this up as we went, but makes sense. And we've um, verified it with our, uh, our Fortran solver. Okay, now after this long preamble, let's see some results. So here the main parameter of interest will be the Lotka Volterra competition coefficients here. And what we're gonna do from panel to panel is restrict the migration. We're gonna, there's gonna be some kind of dispersal limitation as we move from the upper left to the lower right. And the color scheme is as before. And the dash lines here are the deterministic expectation. So you can see when dispersal is high, it basically behaves identical to the deterministic model. But as we restrict dispersal, um, pretty much similar to what we saw with the open system, the coexistence region gets smaller, the founder control region really gets smaller, and you know by process of elimination, the, the competitive exclusion regions get, get larger. Um, until at this point, you know, you really don't see the founder control region anymore. So what else about this? Well, one other th interesting thing to note, this is reassuring, is that these borders, these borders are sharp now, right? They're not fuzzy. They're actually based on invasion criteria. And what we see from them is that they go through um, this neutral point perfectly. So that also gives us some um, better belief that we're, we're getting this right here. The effect of carrying capacity, um, similar to the open system, increasing the carrying capacity extends the proper coexistence region, but it really doesn't do a lot to the apparent, to, to the actual, it's not apparent, to the actual re founder control region. All right, so now another slice through our parameter space we want to look at the effect of the dispersal rate of the two different species. And so here we'll vary the, their dispersal rates and each panel corresponds to a different lack of Volterra outcome based on the symmetric competition coefficient. So if we start here, lower left, um, this is the case of local neutrality. Under local neutrality, there's no regional coexistence except for along this neutral line where the two dispersal rates are equal. Otherwise, whichever species disperses better outcompetes the other one regionally. So neutral coexistence requires not just local neutrality, but also regional neutrality. We move to the right here. Now we're moving into the region of stable coexistence. We can see that in fact, you know, as long as a species is not severely dispersal limited, local coexistence will translate into regional coexistence. And then the upper rows where it gets a little bit perhaps counterintuitive, um, this is the case where the local dynamics are founder control. And we see that there are indeed regions where one or the other species wins at the regional scale, um, but also regional founder control can emerge. And so we'll look at some examples of these 
trying to figure out what's going on with this. So imagine if we take a slice along the uh, ver or horizontal direction here, as we increase species one's dispersal rate, we go from founder control to species one wins, but then back to founder control. So we'll try and figure that out later. Um, but first let's look at the invasion dynamics. So here's a case of local coexistence and here's the parameter values so that species one should outcompete species two at the regional scale. So now I'll show a little movie um, that we made from, from Fortran that's on the left. So this is the regional abundance um, during invasion. And the right is a cartoon um, from the you know, a stochastic simulation, but we didn't actually simulate 96 different wells together. Um, we just forced it with the um, numerical solution. Okay, and then the lower left is the probability distribution, which will now, now change over time. So you see, we're starting out here with, you know, a whole landscape of red patches, but we have one patch which we give to the blue species and watch how it invades. So very quickly, you know, it spreads out everywhere and then it takes over each patch and eventually it outcompetes the red species from the landscape. Okay, so one thing to note is during this process, this probability distribution kind of oozed through the middle of the state space there. So in the middle, there are patches where there's apparent coexistence. Okay. Now we'll look at something similar, but with lower dispersal rates for the two. Same setup otherwise. Now, because of the lower dispersal rate, we see that we're getting into more of a patch dynamics kind of setting where patches are more or less dominated by one species at a time. Okay, what's happening in the founder control region? So again, the blue species is predicted to win at the meta community scale due to its larger dispersal rate. Okay, so we'll start with one patch given to this blue species and see what happens. So we have this mosaic of patches where most of the time it's dominated by one species or the other. But because of you know, the slight asymmetry in the dispersal rates, the blue species you know, eventually wins at the landscape level. Finally, let's get close to the border of where we're going from the blue species winning at the meta community to regional founder control. So, Blue species is dispersing too much. You know, it's sending migrants into red patches, but because of this local founder control, most of the time they get repulsed. But occasionally the blue species gets lucky and turns over one of these patches. But then there's this positive feedback where the process accelerates. And once blue starts to take over, then it ends very quickly. Um, yeah, I can skip this. I'll do the same thing, but where we add this patch extinction. Um, as a separate process. Um, finally, the last paradigm we want to look at is this competition colonization trade-off. So again, here we have to add this patch extinction, which happens at, you know, approx on average every 100 time steps. And we have the setup now as a function of the two dispersal rates. The blue species is hard-coded as the superior competitor. Um, so in this bottom right region, there's no trade-off at all. Actually, species one's just better. Um, in this region, there's a competition colonization trade-off, but the competitor still wins regionally. Um, but if we move to left and make the good competitor a poorer and poorer dispersal, then we get this coexistence region. And finally, where the good colonizer, the, the large disperser wins, and this um, unexpected little region of founder control up here. So let's look at a few of these to get some intuition. So this is a case 
um, in the coexistence region. This is the corresponding stationary probability distribution. So you can see that indeed most patches are dominated by either the blue or the red species. And then there's a spike here at zero, which are patches that were just recently wiped out and have not been recolonized. Well, let's look at the dynamics of that to see if it goes with how, how we think the competition colonization trade-off works. Yeah, basically. Um, if you focus on one patch, you can see that, you know, when it's freshly disturbed, the red species usually gets in there first, but then when the blue one shows up, um, it'll locally outcompete the red, but then, you know, at some point it'll get disturbed again. One slightly weirder one than expect if we move up a little bit higher, make the good colonizer even better disperser. Again, they coexist. But now we have two different kinds of patches dominated by the good um, colonizer or apparently some kind of coexistence of the good competitor and the good colonizer locally. So let's see how that looks. Basically, the red species, the good colonizer, is so good at getting around, it'll certainly take over a freshly disturbed patch. But even when it gets kicked out, by the blue species in a, a patch, it still maintains some abundance through, through mass effects. So this is kind of a hybrid of the competition colonization dynamics along with mass effects. All right, so conclusions, this part of the talk. Um, large migration, as we expect, um, basically matches the well-mixed ordinary differential equation case. Um, when dispersal is limited, small m, um, it makes coexistence hard and really reduces the size of the pounder control region. Um, as we expect, larger population sizes reduce the effect of demographic stochasticity. Um, local neutrality, if you want regional neutrality, then basically all parameters need to be equal, including the dispersal rates. Um, local coexistence, often translates into regional coexistence unless one of the species happens to be like very poor disperser. And under founder control locally, we get this kind of mosaic and then we have this slower dynamic um, of competition between patches. And in this case, it seems that an intermediate migration rate is best. So that you can take over new patches, but you're not you know, breaking up your, your squad and dispersing them too much. So then to end with the prospects, um, in the end, is the Uber meta community model possible? And now we're thinking maybe, okay? So we've handled demographic stochasticity. We've got an infinite number of patches and two species, but it's still in a homogeneous environment underneath. So the next thing to do is add these two different patch types. Um, other things we might want to do with this framework and is probably Metz and Gillenberg already did this, but use this to model the evolution of dispersal, um, apply this to other types of interspecific interactions, extend this to more competitors, maybe, um, although that's gonna you know, basically take us from 10,000 equations to 1 million equations. So we might need to wait 20 years for computers to catch up on that if we don't come up with more um, analytical tricks. And speaking of analytical results, there were none in this talk. So if anyone here has thoughts on how to prove things um, about such model, that would be really cool. So thanks to you all for listening. Um, thanks to our funding sources, NSF RU programs, some local KBS funds, Simons Foundation, and um, my, my friends on the Mathematica Stack Exchange community um, who helped out with the uh, numerical code here. And uh, yeah, I'd take questions if there are any. Thank you so much, Chris, for that, uh, speaking for myself, very inspiring talk. As usual, oh, oh, yes, there are questions. Indeed, just raise your hand in the chat and uh, I will call on you. Simon, please go ahead. Hi, hi, Chris. Thanks very much, Simon. stimulating as, as always. Uh, I, I, I guess I missed at the beginning. Could you repeat what the assumptions are of the connectivity of the patches, the uh, network of interactions? 
Yeah, yeah. Thanks for pointing that out. That's something I should have specifically put in the talk. But you know, it's the same assumption as you know the Levin's meta population and you know the patch dynamics models of of the '80s, um, which is you know it's spatially implicit. Um, there's local patches. Sure. But there's no no. So everything has equal access to everything else. Yeah, it's not a spatially explicit model aside from the two scales involved. Okay, so it might might be interesting to to put that in, in particular to. To look at some non-convex regions yeah um that would be cool although i'm well we'd have to think of an efficient way to do it because uh, i think we wouldn't be able to use our well anyway i don't see i don't see the trick right now to make that happen in an efficient way but maybe there is one thank you thank you so much uh not off please go ahead Okay, um, thanks for, can you hear me? Yes. Thanks for the talk. Um, I have two points. One of them is the just technical comment. Uh, you're, you, you, what you have is not a system of 10,000 differential equation. You have a 10,000 linear problem of dimension 10,000 because you want everything to be zero. All the equations in the steady state you, you, you must have a zero for the dynamics of P1 dot, P2 two dot, and so on. So that you can do it without migration. If just you take a look, if you take diagonal the matrix and find the, not the highest eigenvalue, which is zero and correspond to the absorbing state, but the one before it, right? The, the second highest eigenvalue, this one correspond to the uh, quasi-stationary state. So, I mean, just in case it is more uh, convenient numerically, you can try that. That's, uh, yeah. So I think, that, I think that's true in the open system where we have migrants just coming from who knows where, the region. Um, but when we get to the closed meta community, then you know, our equations become nonlinear because the immigration rate depends on this weighted average of the abundance of all the other ones. Right, right. And so that's, that, so that's so that's the part um, that required a little bit of, of extra thought. But yeah, it's, I mean, certainly I'll look into that on the for the open system. Yeah, and now I have a question about the history dependent uh, scenarios. So the scenarios in which you you start with uh, two species where each of the each of them is stable to invasion of the other species, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, then, you, and then you have demographic stochasticity and migration and so on. Um, so why isn't it the case that the species with a higher migration rate always win? If all other things being equal, like in the Hamilton May model, I would expect that uh, uh, the species with the uh, highest higher uh, migration rate you have higher uh, rate of attempt to colonize the patches of the other species. And since the chance to colonize is uh, fixed per migration attempt, uh, the one that is doing more migration attempts will win. Yeah, it's, I mean, certainly that's the least intuitive part of these results. Um, my feeling is that too much migration is bad because while you're out there migrating to try and take over other patches, um, you're kind of losing your grip on, on the patch you came from, right? So if you disperse too much, then you get underneath the, you know, the threshold. So it's easier for the other species to like take it over. Um, but certainly it's, I mean, it's, it's definitely true because we've looked at this, you know, through different means, you know, using the invasion criteria, using direct numerical simulation. Um, so I think that that's what it is, is basically, you know, if you can think of like a, a battle for a given patch, but then you have to think about the optimal strategy for the, the competitive war across the landscape. And so once you get some territory, you want to kind of hang on to it before you send, you know, all your guys out to try and take another patch. Okay, I mean, because in the Hamilton May model, they have introduced cost for migration. 
So some, some, some of the immigrants died in the way to the next patch. And that's how, that, this is the only reason why they have an optimal migration rate. Otherwise, the, the one with the maximum migration rate is the one that is going to win. So yeah, I don't I think, really understand what's the difference between that and your model, but okay. Well, so I think um, oh, a few things. So first of all, when we incorporate, uh, those results were with no external disturbances. So if we add the external disturbances, then certainly you want to disperse at least enough so that you don't go extinct um, due to that. Um, but also, I think it's this accounting for the fact that like it's not just about you know immigrating to a new patch. It's also you know that organism came from somewhere else, so you're decreasing them from their from their source patch. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Giza, please go ahead. Chris, uh, I'm very happy that you are doing this. And it's very interesting. But uh, I, I was surprised to hear that nothing interesting happens in the neutral point because I expected something very uh, fancy. And in the, in the very first model uh, of your model, in the very middle, when both of the alphas are, are exactly one, there was a small square with uh, red and blue, which means that uh, either one species or the another species exists, uh, which is, uh, uh, I think it's parameter dependent because uh, 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 somehow we see that uh, in the neutral point, uh, there is no coexistence, but and only, oh, okay, uh, here I, I cannot show it, but in the uh, very uh, middle, uh, there is a, a, a red and blue uh, small square that yes uh, uh, and uh, I I would uh, I uh, wish uh, to see there something uh, with coexistence uh, this is the neutral coexistence and I guess it depends on the uh, uh, on the case and the M's uh, that uh, 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 we have some neutral coexistence in the neutral point. Yeah, I mean, I suppose that, you know, the, I mean, I think really like, you know, the, when I'm gearing up to teach um, population community ecology, you know, I introduced this zero case of Lacta Volterra as the, the neutral last theory, because it really has nothing um, besides, you know, community wide density dependence. There's no, migration, there's no anything, there's no drift, and that's where you get this neutral point. But, you know, in this case here, I guess, well, I don't have a figure for it. Um, but here, I mean, we have neutral selection locally, but we still have migration from the region, right? And in some sense, if you were to look at that in terms of like, the effect of migration on the per capita growth rate of a species, then it would be sort of one over n. So there's a sort of like positive um, frequency dependence apparently due to migration. And then, you know, countering the diversifying force of migration, you have the, you know, force of ecological drift, which leads to um, competitive exclusion. And so that's why in this particular low dispersal case um, it just happens to be that you know you end up with these two types mm -hmm. um, if i showed you a similar figure to this but with larger migration rate um, then we would have kind of just a purple square in at that neutral point but it would be surrounded by other purple squares um, not at the neutral point so again there's nothing particularly unique i think about the neutral point here uh, probably if you increase the k uh, this is more uh, realistic because uh, as, uh, uh, there are people who really think that uh, 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 that uh, there are species uh, pairs which uh, coexist ne neutrally, and probably because the the case uh, in its case is uh, uh, quite high, and then uh, the uh, uh, extinction by diffusion is very slow. Yeah, I mean, you know that most of the time when I'm thinking of real systems, I'm thinking of phytoplankton 
which have then, you know, we, we calculated for a paper one time, the abundance of phytoplankton in a lake and it's like 10 to the 18th cells. Um, so, you know, that's why I usually don't worry about demographic mm -hmm. elasticity. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Mike, please go ahead. Hi, Chris, thanks for that. And, and thanks to the students who have been working with you on it. It's, that was really interesting. I was, I was thinking about the sort of analytical possibilities um, and wondering if the moment closure approach that Dave Murrells used with Richard Law and Wolf Diekman, um, they, they've, I think they've applied it in a single patch, spatially explicit multi-species context. Um, I'm just wondering if that might be a useful tool or uh, it's a long time since I've read over that work, but it might be a starting point. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, if you have some papers, send them to me. That would be great. And I saw um, Ben Bolker in the audience. Uh, so we, we've got one of the pros of moment methods here. Um, okay. The thing that, you know, I think it could work in some regimes, um, where you have like the apparent Gaussian distribution, but when you have, you know, this trimodal thing here, then it's probably, uh, it'll require some extra tricks, I think, because this won't be well described by just the, you know, the mean and the variance covariance, because you got those two little ears on the side. Yeah, good point. Okay. All right, I, I can send you papers. Maybe awesome, they thanks. Them or not. Great, thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, Nicholas, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Chris. This was uh, really interesting to think about. My question is about the, um, the, this result that you have where the region of um, founder control gets smaller. And uh, I'm just wondering, you know, the, the founder control is well-defined in the infinite population size case where you just use invasion rates. How do you define it for your demographic model? Right. So, um, actually, I mean, in the meta community, in the the open, the closed system where patches are coupled to each other, we also kind of have an infinite number of organisms because each patch has you know fifty or hundred, but then we have an infinite number of patches, and so that's you know what lets us use invasion criteria a lot at the regional scale, which integrates the local. Um, dynamics along with local demographic stochasticity and dispersal between patches you know it basically adds that all up into you know a proper invasion rate so you know in that part of the talk i would say the definition of regional founder control is, is crisp in the sense that it just means that neither one can invade the other um so what about but yeah your open that, but in the open system it, it's a little bit fuzzier Okay, thanks. Thank you. Mathieu, please go ahead. Yes, and thanks a lot for this very, very nice talk. Uh, I wonder for the closed system you mentioned, when you get to the nonlinear equation, that there is the possibility of having multiple solutions, but it doesn't seem like you actually encounter them, no? Right. Um, well, so we, in the, Yeah, so we have um, multiple equilibria, but it's multiple equilibria in the same sense that there are, uh, sorry, I'm looking for it. Um, you know, we have multiple equilibria, but it's in the same sense that we have multiple equilibria here in the lack of Volterra model. Um, most of the time, only one of them is actually stable. Um, although in the regional founder control case, we have two alternate, you know, stable states. So, that's what I meant by we have multiple equilibria, not necessarily multiple stable equilibria, but you know it's nice that if species one isn't there, it stays not there. I see. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any other questions? While people are thinking, maybe I have a, a few questions. Let me see. Uh, one thing that came to mind is uh, 
when you mentioned at the very end, Chris, uh, about getting analytical results, this might not help you get analytical results, but it might get you relatively painless results, perhaps. How can one apply this to trophic chains and essentially neglect uh, top-down effects and then just build up the chain? And is, is there any hope of getting something interesting out of this? Hmm. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, certainly, um, we've got the machinery now for looking at, I would say, two species, arbitrary two species interactions here. Um, and, you know, in terms of relatively painless, um, fully integrating the time dynamics numerically is about 30 seconds. Um, finding the stationary distribution in the open system is less than a second. Um, finding the, you know, two species equilibrium in the closed meta community, also less than a second. Um, so it's relatively painless. Um, but yeah, I mean, certainly we could apply it to predator, prey, mutualism, dynamics. The, the, I think the problem, and this is where someone else is going to have to come up with some good ideas, good ideas. is extending it to more, more more than two species, right? Because, you know, when we've got two species, the state space is this, you know, two-dimensional lattice. But then if we introduce another species, like times 100, um, so that, that's kind of the, the soft spot here. I, I was I actually, that would have been one of my other questions of through multiple species. And, and I think what one very good thing that you can do here is the invasion criterion, but that might not work anymore for more Speech. I know that's a debate as for how, how good invasion criteria are, but uh, what I mean is in principle. Yeah, I think species. even the problem would be, um, you know, once you get two species coexistence and you start to look at the invasion of the third. But, but solving for the three species equilibrium is going to be tricky, mm -hmm. although probably doable if you're mm -hmm. willing to wait. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, uh, the uh are there more? yeah no no okay no uh, uh not off please go ahead <laughs> you should, ah. should ask a question okay okay so um just i, I just remind myself now uh, the paper of simon levine and rick Dubert, uh, from 1974 i think the importance of being discreet and special in this paper, they considered exactly the case of uh, history dependent of uh, alternative steady states. And they showed that if you have a spatial model, and now this is a really spatial model, not a model with uh, immigration from every site to every site, but uh, immigration from each site to neighboring sites, then unless alpha one, two is exactly equal to alpha two, one, you have one species that will win in, invade the other. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm familiar with that. Um, it's so I really enough. cannot understand why in your model, you just play with a, a migration here. So why in your model, you have a, a patches that are, uh, you, you have, um, you have um, cases of uh, history dependence, even though, I mean, you, the only change is, is uh, that now the diffusion is global and this makes the problem, I mean, this makes a history dependent state even more rare. Yeah, I mean, so I guess what you're saying is that you're not surprised by the fact that in the local founder control region, this can lead to one or the other species winning. Um, because I think a lot of empiricists would think in the, if you have local founder control that you're going to go out in the real world and expect to see some mosaic of coexistence, which never happens in the model, um, at least as time goes infinity. Um, so I guess you're more surprised by the fact that founder control manages to persist in yes. this spatial model. Yeah, um, I guess if we, you know, this is just, I, I agree, it's a little bit of a <laughs> head scratcher. Well, actually one of the things Simon uh, mentioned earlier when he was talking about um, non-convex domains and spatial model is um, I think, you know, Mimura in the seventies and maybe even Simon 
in 74. You know, if you have like two patches or even a continuous space, but shaped in some kind of barbell shape, um, then you can get persistent um, alternate stable states because dispersal from one patch to the other one is restricted enough such that the, you know, the alternate stable states survive a little bit of dispersal. And so maybe it's the fact that our patches are discrete. Um, I mean, we also see in the results here. Okay. So I guess what you're saying is you would predict something like this. Yes, exactly. Blue, red, everywhere. Exactly. On the other hand, it also, you know, it's, you know, it leads almost it's a head scratcher, but then if you think about in the case of large dispersal, I'm pretty sure we could prove that in the limit or someone could prove in the limit of large dispersal that this is going to, you know, approach the, the, the local ODE case, right? Where this is all um, founder control. So I guess I'm not totally surprised that this manages to persist, this alternate stable states region manages to persist for, Large, not infinite dispersal. I see. But okay. yeah, it's, uh, it's a little bit weird. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I might have another one if you have patience for me, Chris, which okay. is uh, more philosophical and uh or, or rather actually very practical in terms of the applicability of of, of this kind of thinking about meta communities that uh, if we take demographic stochasticity so seriously then we assume low population sizes but then if say the local patches are large enough then it's actually not so likely that uh, two low density populations would meet and interact so this kind of model probably describes something in a, and, and this is where I, I wonder about your thinking. My, my immediate thought is, is, is this something where the local patches are very small in some relevant sense? Uh, or, or how, so, so, so where do you see the applicability of, of, of the case where both competition and demographic stochasticity are important together? Right. Yeah, I mean, I think as you point out, um, this basically is for, I mean, we know that demographic stochasticity, stochasticity, how it scales with, you know, square root of population size, um, well, one over. Uh, so, yeah, I think for large enough populations, then this is probably not, not a thing. Um, and that suits me fine because I don't want to do this every time I want to look at two species competing. I want to use, you know, two ordinary differential equations and forget about all this. So I think it's indeed for the case where, you know, the local population size is, is quite small, probably on the order of 50, 100, 200 individuals. And I'm sure there are systems like that. Um, I, I typically don't study them, which makes me happy. Um, but, I mean, it's really interesting. So the literature of this in the epidemiology world with these household structured models, you know, there are the local patch scale is the disease dynamics within a household. And there it's like, you know, the carrying capacity is like two, three, four or five individuals, right? Um, so that would be, you know, another case where it could be applicable. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, good point. Because in, in the first case, I'm thinking, so, so it's, it's not just that we require that the population sizes to be locally small. We want them not just to be small, but still to interact with one another. So maybe large predators that can traverse lots of space and therefore they can be locally rare and yet interact with their prey or would, would that be, I'm just thinking out loud. I haven't thought about this, but uh, uh, probably ponds and Daphnia doesn't work, or, or, or well, well, it works, but why do it when we can, as you say, just write down deterministic differential equations? Yeah, I think it could be more for um, maybe phytotelemata, you know, like organisms that live in like um, plant parks could be one. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, should probably think of some good examples before we submit this. <laughs> I'm thinking that this, this is actually great, but it, it probably has this kind of applicability uh, where, where uh, uh, 
uh, in a way that might be good. I don't know. Not that you need any tips from me for, for how to uh, pitch this, but uh, I'm wondering if one way to motivate why one would need to do this as opposed to say some sort of patch occupancy models where what we model is the probability of the, the of, of a given species being present in a given patch uh, the reason why we the, when we can do that is when uh, the way of taking species interactions into account uh, is limited for some reason uh, for example we were thinking about this some time ago in doing a trophic meta community model where uh, we assume that there's no interaction between things at the on, on, on similar levels so, so there's no competition and there's no top-down effects which is essentially saying that what we assume is that the if there's a plant and there's a butterfly then because these populations are small the butterfly cannot possibly cause enough appreciable damage to the plant population at the, any patch. So, but the lack of the plants means that the butterfly can definitely not be there. But in your case, as you say, we, we, we need a system where, where uh, the, there is heavy species interaction despite the, the, the low population sizes. Yeah, so, small but dense. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yep. Uh, are there any other questions? If none, then thank you again, Chris, for the great right. talk. Yeah, thanks again for the invitation. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And uh, thank you all for coming. We're going to continue in two weeks. So see you then uh, for the next iteration of the seminar. So thank you all and uh, have a good rest of your day. Bye, everyone. <laughs>